important thing remains. When is James Harden going to get traded and where? So what is your sense after the fine and the suspension and everything else of where things stand right now with the possibility of Harden getting moved? Well, I think that we have to take into consideration what James Harden is trying to do here. The fact of the matter is he wants out of Houston, plain and simple. He no longer wants to be a Houston Rocket. That's really what this comes down to. And uh, from, from the moment that he alerted them that he would like to be moved to Brooklyn, obviously the initial reaction was, hell no, we're not letting go of a, a guy that's averaged over 30 the last three years, one of the most prolific scorers this game has ever seen. Uh, but never, evidently they entertain phone calls and things of that nature, and they're not hearing uh, the kind of offers that they want to hear. I'm sure that they've alerted James Harden about that and as a result has given him the impression that obviously we're not going to let you go for close to nothing. We want equitable compensation. And since that's not being offered, you know, in other words, they're saying to him, you're going to be stuck here. James Harden, in response, in my opinion, has just basically gone about the business of doing whatever he can to alert the world that he wants out. James Harden, is a professional. Yeah, you've heard the reports about the tardiness and things of that nature. Let's take into consideration the, mat the fact that the man never engages in load management. He's always playing over 35 minutes a night. He's always dependable. He shows up game night. He's always ready to ball. He doesn't like taking time off. Doesn't even like coming out of the game. Night in, night out, he's played through injuries and everything like that. So this is a guy that's a baller that wants to play. Why would he all of a sudden do this? The only thing that makes sense is the fact that he wants to be disruptive because he wants to force his way out of Houston because he recognizes just being professional and towing the company line ain't going to get him out of H-Town. In my opinion, that's what this is about. That's why you've seen some of the things that you've seen from him. He's trying to force his way out of Houston, and ultimately they will have to capitulate in some way even though he's under contract for the next two years because you can't have this kind uh, of distraction going on throughout the season, particularly with a first-time head coach in Steven Silas at the helm. You're not giving him a fair shot. They know that. They're just trying to get the equitable compensation they're looking for. Yeah, I'm with you completely. I said on the radio the day this all started, they've already traded him. They just don't know it yet. It's just a question of where he winds up and how it winds up going down. Okay, yes. so so let's turn our attention to, to the league big picture because we sometimes call Christmas Day the beginning of the NBA season. Well, in this case, it practically is. It just started this week. So let me start in, in the West. The Lakers are everybody's favorite. So if I put the question to you this way, if it's not going to be the Lakers in the West, who is it going to be? Or it's going to be the Clippers if it's not going to be the Lakers. And don't get me wrong, it's going to be the Lakers. But the Clippers have the best shot of knocking them off. I understand Dallas, once Porzingis get back, is a formidable threat. Portland can't be ignored. We get all of that. And since Klay Thompson is not in Golden State, we don't really have to worry about them challenging for the chip this year. But I think you have to look at the Clippers, not just from the standpoint of Kawhi Leonard and Paul George as players, even with Ty Lu as the new coach. Lou Williams and those boys can still play. Serge Ibaka was a big-time pickup. But let's consider the level of motivation that the Clippers had. They completely wet the bed in Game 7. I'm talking about Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. Paul George had 26 and 33 in Games 5 and 6, respectively. Kawhi showed up in those games as well, but they were MIA in a Game 7. A lot of people are looking at Paul George and saying he's got to step up. He's got to play better. Fair enough. But I'm looking at Kawhi Leonard. Yes, you're a two-time champion with a two-time NBA Finals MVP. But last year was the first time that you were in the eye of the storm. You were the real, the legitimate face of a franchise. You had your New Balance commercials. You were driving in your car with a king's crown dangling from your car mirror. You had L.A. signs basically giving the indication a new king has arrived in town. I'm here to take over LeBron's spot and all of that stuff. And then you give up a 3-1 lead and wet the bed in a Game 7. Hell no. We ain't going for that. Kawhi Leonard's got to show up. I believe that he's a great player, one of the top five players in the game. So he will show up. And as a result, with his supplementary parts, I think that makes them the most formidable threat to the Los Angeles Lakers. I'm not dismissing the Denver Nuggets because we can't ignore Jamal Murray and the Joker and those boys. Please don't get me wrong. But Kawhi Leonard has got to show up. I think he knows it. I think Paul George knows it. As a matter of fact, he said so. And I consider them the number one threat to the Los Angeles Lakers. Yeah, I'm with you also on not sleeping on Denver, which is why as we look on our screen here, our analytics don't put Denver in the top four, and that surprises me. Let's go to the East, where it was a very good start, albeit just one game for KD and Kyrie and the Brooklyn Nets. What are your expectations for them this season? Trip to the finals. Um, listen, when Kevin, Kevin Durant, if he's healthy, 
He's unstoppable. He's one of the greatest offensive forces we've ever seen, and he's, cred he's incredibly efficient. And Kyrie Irving is just a showstopper. Let's just call it what it is. He is box office. You do walk through the turnstiles to see this brother put on the show. He's that spectacular. But Karis LeVert can ball, and he's going to be maybe the sixth man of the year. You've got Spencer Dinwiddie in that lineup. Joe Harris can shoot the ball. I love the pickup of Landry Sharman from the Clippers last year. He's there now, along with uh, Jeff Green and Torian Prince and these boys. They've got got a deep team. They've got an athletic team. They've got some greyhounds. They've got shooters. The question about them is their defense and obviously their coaching because this is Steve Nash's first year coaching ever on any level. But we respect him. We know what a savant he is on a basketball court. So the bottom line is you don't expect a drop off in the coaching ranks when it comes to him. In the end, though, it comes down to the greatness of KD. We can look at the Greek freak. We can look at the Ben Simmons, the Joel Embiid's of the world. We can't ignore Miami. Jason Tatum is the real deal along with Jalen Brown we get all of that I don't think Boston is deep enough and I think when you look at those other parts none of them can shoot like Kevin Durant can and none of them can stop Kevin Durant let's be very very clear about that when it's time to get buckets Kevin Durant can do that against anyone on the planet earth and that's what I think will be the difference and the Brooklyn Nets against the Los Angeles Lakers will be our NBA Finals in July. That would be a dream scenario, obviously, when you have LeBron against KD and LeBron against Kyrie. That would be all we could ask for, but we obviously have a long way to go to get there. Stephen A., have a great show today. The best to you and everybody on the crew at First Take, and we will see you soon. Enjoy the hoops today. Merry Christmas. Thank you so much to all of y'all. The great Stephen A. Smith. And again, they're coming up right after us. And then right after that, the basketball begins. Noon Eastern on ESPN, you get Pelican Seat. Then on ABC, Warriors, Bucks, Net Celtics. Mavs, Lakers comes up next. That's on ABC and ESPN. And then cap your night with the Clippers and the Nuggets wrapping it up tonight. 1030 Eastern, all five amazing matchups also available on the ESPN app. It is Christmas Day, and that means the return here of Woody Claus, who was with us earlier today to give out some gifts to everyone who made his nice list. But now, everybody beware, because it's time to hand out some lumps of coal to everyone who made their way onto the naughty list. All right, Woody Claus, who are you giving your first lump of coal to this Christmas? Yeah, you know, Woody Claus, hate giving coal out to, you know, in the naughty list, but I got to go with the Los Angeles Rams. You had the inside track at the NFC West. You're playing against an 0-13 team in the, New, in the New York Jets, and you just totally slipped up and lost to a, a winless team. Your team played awful on Sunday, and so now Woody Cross got to give you a lump of coal as your Christmas gift. Can I chime in on that? Can I throw a few extra in there when you consider the ramifications of that game? I, I don't know what role I can play in this, uh, Woody Claus, but I'm all in on this. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely chime in. There's a lot. Listen, I don't, we don't need to throw in the Jets, but if you want to chime in something, go, go ahead, right ahead. Whatever is worse than a lump of coal, that's what I'd like to contribute. Okay, who gets you a second? <laughs> who, is, who is next on the naughty list, Woody Claus? Yes, the, the next the 